Dorothy Must Die Stories by Daniel Page. Book 2. The Witch Must Burn. Chapter 1. Things have been pretty weird lately in Oz. I mean, if you're not from around here, things are always a little weird in Oz. There are the flying monkey, sure, and the road of yellow brick, which isn't exactly the most reliable for you in the world. It moves around. We have magic. More about that later. And animated soldiers that used to be toys, and a city made out of emeralds, and trees that talk. We have an enchanted palace. That's where I work as a servant. We have a wizard with extra special powers. We had a wizard anyway, until he disappeared. We have cornfields that grow pre-toasted corn on the cob, and talking animals, and a cowardly lion who's exactly not so cowardly, and it's becoming a little bit scary. He talks too. But for all of us, it's not that big of a deal. We're used to it. The really weird thing about Oz these days? Her name is Dorothy, and she's my boss. Technically, Ozma's my boss. She's the rightful ruler of Oz. And when she was running the show, things were great for us here in the Emerald City. I don't know anything about where I'm from. I was left on the doorstep of the Emerald Palace as a tiny baby. Ozma and I grew up together there. I knew she'd one day be the ruler of Oz, too, but she never acted like someone who was about to be queen. She was my best friend, and the palace servants became my family. I never knew anything else. Then Dorothy showed up, the first time, and everything changed. She killed the Wicked Witch of the East, and with the help of the Tin Woodman, the Scarecrow, and the Cowardly Lion, the Wicked Witch of the West, she saved Oz. Then she vanished back to the other place, the world she came from, where magic doesn't exist. Ozma took her rightful place in the throne, and things were basically perfect, although I still didn't know anything about my real family. I lived in the palace for my whole life, and Ozma and the servants were the only family I needed. I loved my work in the palace, as strange as that may sound. It gave me a real sense of pride to do a good job keeping everything running. Nobody plans a banquet like I do. I can remember the names of every signal dignitary in Oz, and their children, pets, favorite foods, preferred seating arrangements, wives, husbands, ex-wives, ex-husbands, and what room in the palace they most like to stay in when they visit. My detail-oriented nature is what makes me good at my job. And that's why Ozma ultimately promoted me to the youngest ma head maid in the history of Oz. I wasn't going to be a famous queen or a powerful sorceress, and I was fine with that. I was good at something that I loved, and I got to spend my life doing it. And then Dorothy came back. That's when things got weird. She was different. She wasn't the sweet, innocent girl that we all adored who had saved Oz. Dorothy moved into the palace, and this time she was here to stay. And then, after a palace ball one night, suddenly Ozma wasn't herself anymore. Overnight, she went from our vivacious, caring, generous queen to a vacant ghost of herself, wandering the halls of the palace like the world's creepiest talking doll. Sometimes she didn't even recognize us. At first, Dorothy pretended she was helping out, ruling on Ozma's behalf. She kept Ozma close to her side. But then Dorothy dropped the pretense pretty quickly, and none of us knew how to stop her, or even if we could. Suddenly, our peaceful palace was full of soldiers. They looked like the Tin Woodmen, but there was something about them that didn't feel right. The Scarecrow left his own corncob mansion out in the hills of Oz and moved into the palace, where he shut himself up in a suite of rooms and began to work on something mysterious that Dorothy prefer referred to it as his experiments. The Scarecrow had always seemed so harmless before. Just kind of dopey and pleasant, despite his brain upgrade. But the maids who took him his meals came back from his room with stories about sinister equipment in cages covered in blankets, behind which they could hear rustling and faint, soft moans like something crying out of pain. We'd see lights coming from his rooms at all hours and hear crashing and banging in the middle of the night. Pretty soon I had to bribe my staff with extra time off in order to give them as much as to clean the hallway outside his room, and the stories of what they saw inside sent chills up my spine. Dorothy acted as though nothing was wrong, as though whatever was happening was totally normal. If any of us asked her about it, she'd fly off the handle in one of her infamous tantrums, so we left it alone. I also quickly realized that Dorothy doesn't like me, and I'm careful to keep myself useful. I want to figure out what's going on in the palace, and with Ozma, and I can't do that if Dorothy kicks me out, and I think when she, she realizes that dismissing me out of out of hand would clue the rest of the servants in to fact that something was really wrong. Ozma would never condone such a thing, and for all intents and purposes, Ozma is still the ruler of Oz. 
I make sure for the time being to keep everything the way Dorothy likes it. I make sure her rows and rows of dresses are hung neatly, organized by color, occasion, and material. And yes, of course, season. Her bacon is extra crispy. The doors are, floors are extra scrubbed. I know exactly what it takes to keep the palace running like clockwork. And Dorothy knows I know. And so, for now, we're kind of at a standoff. She hates me, but she can't get rid of me, and I intend to keep it that way. She is the only one who's allowed to use magic in the palace. She says there's too much of a risk of disaster otherwise, but I think the real reason is that she doesn't want anyone to have more power than she does. I'm not sure how much longer I can stand it here. Every w once in a while, I get a chance to pause for a moment at a window, looking out over the glittering green towers of Oz and daydreaming about what life used to be like when Ozma was in charge and Oz was the way it should be. When Dorothy was a national hero, not a national menace, when Jillia, Dorothy's voice tore through the air, a piercing shriek that made me flinch. I've been scrub scrubbing the palace floor since sunrise. Dorothy had been on a tear since she staggered out of bed long after the palace was up and bustling. And I'd had the bad luck to be standing right next to her when she decided the floors were filthy, despite the fact that we cleaned them the day before. I set up for my brush and bucket as the relentless tap, tap, tap of her heels came storming out of the room, and just barely scrambled to my feet and, ex and executed a clumsy curtsy. What are you doing? She snarled. Why are you filthy? She'd used magic that morning to dress herself. There was no mistaking the way she was stuffed into her corseted, corseted and impossibly short dress, or the glittering haze that surrounded her as she moved. Her hair was curled into a tight girlish ringlets that were a strange contrast to her glossy red mouth and heavily rouged cheeks. As always, her magical red shoes glowed like the fires of hell. If you get close to those shoes, it's almost as though you could hear them talking to you in a low, seductive whisper. You look terrible, Dorothy said. So do you, I thought. You asked me to scrub the floors this morning. I kept my eyes downcast. I most certainly absolutely did no such thing, Jillia. She always said my name like it was the worst insult she could think of. It drove me nuts. I dared to look up at, at her through my, eyela through my eyelashes, trying to judge her mood. If she'd truly forgotten, I'd, make, I'd only make her angrier by contradicting her. If she was trying to torment me, she'd, always, she'd only leave me alone once. She saw me squirm like a worm on a hook. She was looking out the window with a scowl, her attention already elsewhere, which meant I wasn't on her hit list for the day. Yet. I rolled my eyes and swallowed my pride. I must have misheard, your majesty, I mumbled. Get yourself cleaned up at once, she snapped. I'm throwing a banquet, and it has to be perfect, and I want all my dresses laid out, and the ballroom prepared, and I want all the munchkins out of sight, every last one of them, especially that filthy little blue one. Is that clear? Of course, your majesty. Someone is visiting the palace? Glinda is returning tomorrow, she said coolly. Even I, practiced as I was becoming and keeping my emotions out of my expressions, couldn't hide my shock. Glinda was one of the most powerful witches in Oz. Possibly THE most powerful witch in Oz. Rumor had it that she was somehow responsible for Dorothy's return, although no one exactly knows what she'd done. Then Glinda had vanished shortly after Dorothy had moved into the palace. I know I wasn't the only one who breathed a sigh of relief. Glinda is coming here, I blurted. Dorothy narrowed her eyes, studying my face, and I cursed my big mouth. If she was back in the Emerald City now, I was pretty sure it wasn't to deck at us out in ball gowns and tiaras. Surely you're thrilled, she said, and I recognized that danger in her voice. Of course, I scrambled to cover my slip-up. I'm just, it's just a surprise to have such, um, I was hit with a burst of inspiration. Such an exalted guest. It will be an honor to receive her. An expression of disgust crossed her face. And change your dress, she said. You look like you crawled out of a sewer. She laughed out loud at her own joke, pivoting on one glittering heel and stalking out of the room. Her ridiculously short dress switched back and forth in each stride. I sighed and scowled down at my mop bucket. Something was up, and I had the sinking feeling whatever was about to happen wasn't going to be good.